in this module we'll be covering a fascinating little concept known as z-scores. But before we begin that, I just want to take a moment and review this really important thing. First, what does this symbol mean? Pause your video if you need to and take a second to articulate it for yourself. That is pronounced mu. It's the mean of a population. What does this symbol mean? We say that as sigma, and it represents the standard deviation of a population. What percentage of scores fall under this portion of the curve? Hopefully you said about 70%. What percentage fall under this portion of the curve? Hopefully you said about 95%. Those principles, or I should say those facts, are going to come in handy as we go throughout this module. Let's say you got a 76 on an exam. Is that a good or bad score compared to the rest of the class? Really, it depends on how the rest of the class did. If the mean of the test scores in the class was 70 and the standard deviation was 3, that would mean that you did two standard deviations above the average student and you would fall in like the top 97 percent if the mean of the class were 70 and a standard deviation of 12 that would mean that you fell kind of like right in the middle 70 percent of students right here in the bulk and that would mean that you didn't do that hot the purpose of z-scores is to allow us to make those kinds of comparisons that we just did. A z-score identifies and describes the location of every score in the distribution. It allows us to standardize an entire distribution, and we can take different distributions and make them equivalent to each other and comparable to each other. When you have a score, and you compute a z-score from that score, it allows you to des describe the exact location of that score in the distribution with just one number. There are two parts of a z-score. The sign, whether it's positive or negative, tells whether the score is located above or below the mean. So you see here a z of negative 2 is below the mean and a z of positive 1 is above the mean. The number tells the distance between the score and the mean in standard deviation units. So this is two standard deviations away from the mean, and this is one standard deviation away from the mean. If I were to interpret the entire z-score, both of its components together, I would say the score that yielded this z-score was two standard deviations below the mean. The original score that led to this z-score was one standard deviation above the mean. This means that a z-score can be directly compared to other distributions if we also change those distributions to z-scores. I'll give examples of what that looks like in a minute. This chart shows the relationship between z-scores and their locations. A z-score corresponds with units of standard deviation. So, if a score has a z-score of positive 1, that means it falls here at one standard deviation above the mean. If a z-score has uh, if a z-score is negative 1, then it falls here at one standard deviation below the mean. Positive 2 falls here at 1, 2 standard deviations above the mean, and negative 2 falls 1, 2 standard deviations below the mean. The equation for computing a z-score is here. z equals x minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. The numerator of this equation is a deviation score. Remember from our last module that deviation scores are to tell us how far away a score is from the mean. So how far away a score is from the mean. The denominator expresses that distance in terms of standard deviation units. 
Remember that z-scores identify a specific location of a score in terms of deviations from the mean and relative to the standard deviation. So it's taking the original score and telling us how far it is from the mean in terms of standard deviations. By way of analogy, you might consider needing to transform 20 minutes into hours. If you were to do that, you would take 20 minutes and divide it by 60 minutes per hour. The minutes would cancel each other out, and you would be left with one-third hour as the answer of how many hours 20 minutes is. What we've done here is express a value, an original score, in that existed in one unit of measurement and expressed it using another unit of measurement here, minutes per hour. Um, we've expressed it in different terms. That's similar to the x divided by the standard deviation. We haven't computed a distance of how far 20 minutes was from some other value, but you can see that uh, that the principle here of converting one measure into a different unit is similar to what we've done here by taking a deviation score and putting it in terms of a different unit. I want to practice here for, on a couple of examples. A distribution of scores has a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 10. What z-score corresponds to a score of 130 in this distribution? And where would we draw this z-score on the histogram? I want you to pause your video for a minute and work through that using the z-score formula that you have here. Plug in the values that you have above and figure out where you would plot that z-score on this distribution. Hopefully, you figured out that the x value was 130, the mean was 100, and the standard deviation was 10, which would, if you carry out the formula, leave you a z-score of 3. To plot that on this distribution here, you would carry 1, 2, 3 standard deviations above the mean, and that right there is where the score would land. Here's the second exercise. A distribution of scores has a mean of 86 and a standard deviation of 7. What z-score corresponds to a score of 95 in this distribution? And where would we draw that z-score in the histogram? Go ahead and pause your video and work through that. Hopefully you discovered that 95 is the original score, 86 is the, is the mean, and 7 is the standard deviation. When you carry out that formula, 95 minus 86 over 7, you should get about 1.29. And a z-score of 1.29 would fall one and about a, somewhere between a quarter and a third above the one standard deviation mark. So it would be about 1.29 standard deviations above the mean, somewhere around there. We can actually take that z-score formula and algebraically rearrange it to solve for x, thus revealing that the original score is equal to the mean plus the z-score times the standard deviation. This alternate version of the formula is helpful if we want to determine a raw score from a z-score. Say we only know what somebody's z-score was and we wanted to translate it back into its original terms. Here's an example. For a distribution with a mean of 60 and a standard deviation of 5, what original x value corresponds to a z-score of negative 3. Hopefully you discovered that as you replace the mean here in this formula with 60 and the standard deviation here in this formula with 5, your z-score being negative 3, if you carry out this formula, you should result in an original score of 45. Now that I've showed you those formulas, I want to highlight the fact that those appear on your formula sheet here under z-scores. This is the first column at the bottom of the first page, and you'll see here that you've got, in order to compute a single z-score, 
you can use the original formula I showed you, or if you algebra algebraically rearrange that formula to solve for x, you can find the original score given a z-score. We will eventually get to an entire sample z-score, but that's not going to fall in this module, so just ignore that for now. Let's walk through another example. In a population with a mean of 65, a score of 59 corresponds to a z of negative 2. What's the standard deviation in that case? So here, we're solving for a different component of the equation that I haven't showed you a formula for. I don't even actually want you to algebra algebraically rearrange the formula to solve for the standard deviation. I just want you to think it through. If you sketch it out, you'll see that the distribution should have a shape like this with a mean of 65. And a score of 59 has a z-score of negative 2, so that means it's two standard deviations below the mean. Right here, you can see there's two standard deviations below the mean. What's the distance between 59 and 65? 6 points. So how far, if 6 points is two standard deviations, does one of the standard deviations have to be? 3 points. Let's walk through another. In a population distribution, a score of 54 corresponds to a z of positive 2 and a score of 42 corresponds to a z of negative 1. Let's figure out from that information what are the values for the mean and the standard deviation. Well, again, if you sketch it out, you'll see that we can easily plot where a z-score of positive 2 falls and a z-score of negative 1 using the standard, de the standard distribution with the locations of the standard deviations. So a z-score of positive 2 corresponds with 54, and a z-score of negative 1 corresponds to 42. Again, if we discern how far apart these points are right here, 42 to 54, we see that that's 12 points. If we know that that's 1, 2, 3 standard deviations, we could take that 12 points and divide it across the 3 standard deviations to discern that the standard deviation is 4. If we know that the standard deviation is 4, then we can figure out how far above 42 the mean is. Since that's one standard deviation of 4, it's 4 points higher than 42, meaning that the mean is 46. You could also say that it's 8 points lower than 54, because it's two standard deviations lower than 54. So the answer to this is that the mean is 46 and the standard deviation is 4. When you um, take every x value and transform it into a z-score, you standardize the distribution. There are certain characteristics that you can always count on in a standardized distribution. If every score is a z-score after a z-score transformation, then the distribution will have the same shape as the original distribution. Basically, you're just relabeling each score. It will have a mean of z, uh, a mean z score of zero and a standard deviation of one. Those principles will always be true no matter the shape of your original distribution. So if we took this normal distribution here that has a population mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 10, going through the process of transforming every score into a z score, your final distribution will have a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. This is, again, always the case. It will always have a mean of 0, and it will always have a standard deviation of 1. Following a z-score transformation, the x-axis is just relabeled in z-score units. The distance that's equivalent to one standard deviation on the x-axis in this example, it's 10 points, corresponds to one point on the z-score scale. So you can see here that the standard deviation that used to be 10 is now just 1. We replace the original x-axis with new units where the mean is 0 and the standard deviation is 1.
each original score stays in its place. The shape of the distribution is retained. Nothing changes except the label of what we're calling each score and the label, therefore, of what we're calling the x-axis. Now, I've demonstrated using logic that z-scores don't change the shape of a distribution, but this example will show it in a more concrete way. Let's say that we have a population of just six scores, and they're the following, 0, 6, 5, 2, 3, and 2. You can see them listed in this table, 0, 6, 5, 2, 3, and 2. The population of this set of scores, if you were to compute it, would have a mean of 3 and a standard deviation of 2. If we went through the process of computing the z-score for each of these original scores, you would see that this original score of 0 is below the mean by 1.5 standard deviations. 0 is below the mean of 3 by 3 points. Since the standard deviation is 2, it's actually be below the standard sorry, below the mean by 1.5 standard deviations. So the z-score would be negative 1.5. A score of 6 is above the mean by that same amount. It's 3 points above, so it's above the mean by 1.5 standard deviations. It has a z-score of positive 1.5. A score of 5 is above the mean by exactly 1 standard deviation. The mean is 3, the standard deviation is 2, and since 5 is just 2 points above the standard deviation, it has a z-score of 1 positive 1. If we went through this entire distribution and transformed each of them into z-scores, you would see that plotted, they, uh, the original scores have the exact same shape as the z-score distribution when it's plotted. Here are the original scores, here are the z-scores. If you look, the original score of 0 plotted here is plotted below at negative 1.5. The original score of 6 up here is plotted down below as a z-score of 1.5 right there. So you can see that when we plot these original scores and we plot these z-scores, the shape of the distribution is exactly the same, but instead of having a scale that falls from 0 to 6 with a mean of 3 and a standard deviation of 2, we have a z-score distribution that falls from negative 1.5 to positive 1.5 with a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. Z-scores have some really important principles um, that, that make them especially useful. All Z-scores are comparable to each other. If you take one from one distribution and you take one from a different distribution, you can compare the relative placement that they would be if they had come from the same distribution, even though they didn't. That means that if you were to take scores from any distribution, you could convert them into z-scores, and those z-scores could then be compared to each other as if they came from the same distribution originally, from the same sample, from the same population. And that allows us to draw comparisons even when the original scale wasn't the same. Let's go through an example. Dave scored 60 on a psychology exam and 56 on a biology test. You might wonder in which class did he do better. I'm not saying 60% and 56%. I'm saying those are the, the points he got. And if you were to compare his performance in those two classes in a curve compared to the rest of the students in the class, you would expect him to get different grades depending on how many points were available and how other students did in the class. So we can't really answer this question unless we know additional information. Let's say the psychology test had a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 10. And the biology test had a mean of 48 and a standard deviation of 4. If you transform both of his test scores into z-scores, then you can see which test he did better on relative to the other students. Here I've computed the z-scores pretty quickly, but you might just pause the video and work through looking at how the original scores map onto this formula and how we got the z-score of positive 1 for psychology and positive 2 for biology.
But once we have those two computed, we can ask the question, in which class did he perform better? Hopefully you recognized that a score of positive 2 in Z score units would be much better than a score of positive 1, because a Z score of positive 1 corresponds with performing within the top 85% or so of students, but a Z score of 2 is like 97% of students. You can see that in a distribution, if you imagine the shape of a distribution, a standard deviation 1 above the mean is much lower than a standard deviation 2, uh, two standard deviations above the mean. Z-scores are useful, but they have decimals and negative numbers, which can be annoying. It's not always intuitive to interpret for some people, and um, uh, it's more difficult to work with. So a process of standardization is widely used to overcome these problems. Standardizing a distribution has two steps. First, you take the original raw scores and you transform them into z-scores. Then, you take the z-score distribution and transform that one into new x-values so that the specific predetermined mean and standard deviation are attained. I know that sounds a little, in, uh, a little confusing, so let me walk through a couple of examples. SAT scores have a mean of 500 on each component, like the, the verbal and the quant components, and they have a standard deviation of, of 100. But that didn't just, like, luckily happen. When you administer the test, it doesn't magically happen that students just, on average, happen to score 500, and they happen to have a standard deviation of 100. They actually get however many questions right that they do, on average, and scientists take the distribution of performance across the students on the SAT, and they transform that distribution into z-scores. And then they transform the z-score distribution again into a new distribution that has a mean of 500 and a standard deviation of 100, just because that's what they decided. That's just an arbitrary designation that they picked. An IQ distribution has similar principles. It has a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. There's no real reason why those numbers were chosen. It certainly didn't just happen that magically in the that when they took the uh, the the IQ test questions and administered them to the entire population of people that magically the average person just got 100 and that the standard deviation across the population just happened to be 15. Rather, they took whatever the original scores were and they transferred them into z-scores and they took those z-scores with a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1 and they put them into a new distribution that had a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15 just because that's what they arbitrarily designated. Let me show you an example of how that would end up looking. If Joe scored 43 on a test right here, we could transform his original score into a z-score. It would be then negative 1. And then, if we wanted to, we could make up a new standardized score where the mean of the distribution would have uh, would be 50, and the standard deviation of the distribution would be 10. And if we did that, then Joe's score would be 40, because it's 10 points, one standard deviation, below the mean. But the location of Joe's score within the distribution stays the same through both of these transformations. And in the end, we could compare his score to another person, like Maria, even if Maria took a different test to begin with. We can compute z-scores for a sample as well as for a population. Populations are the most common context for computing z-scores, but it's possible to do it for both. In a z-score for a sample, the same principles hold true as did for a population. The unit of the z-score, uh, sorry, the sign and the and the magnitude of the z represent its uh, location above or below the mean and how far in standard deviation units. So 
the z-score will still indicate its relative position in the sample and it will indicate the distance from the sample mean rather than the population mean. So you can see that the formula is very similar. x minus the mean over the standard deviation. The only difference here is we're substituting in the notation for a sample, an italicized m instead of mu, and an italicized s for standard deviation instead of sigma. This is so similar, in fact, that I haven't included it in your formula sheet. I just wrote that if you're computing a z-score, you do x minus mu over sigma. But if you're dealing with a sample, you can just replace the mean of the sample for the mean of the population, and the standard deviation of the sample for the standard deviation of the population. Sample distribution can be transformed into z-scores, and it would then have the same properties as when a population is transformed to a z-score. It would retain the same shape as the original distribution, and the mean would be 1, I'm sorry, the mean would be 0, and the standard deviation would be 1. Now let's take just a moment here at the end of this module to look ahead to inferential statistics. This is, after all, the entire goal of what we're working forward, uh, looking forward to and working towards in this course. When we run inferential statistics, our goal is to interpret research results based on whether something is noticeably different after treatment than it was before treatment. So if we had an original population that didn't undergo any kind of treatment, and we drew a sample of people from the population, gave them a treatment, and we had a treated sample then, we might ask the question, are they noticeably different, substantially higher or lower than the original population? If they are, that suggests to us that the treatment probably worked. If they're really similar to the original population, then we have to conclude that probably the treatment didn't do anything. One technique for defining this principle of noticeably different uses z-scores. Here's an example. We might ask the research question, does a new growth hormone that we developed work? You have a population of regular adult rats. They weigh an average of 400 grams with a standard deviation of 20 grams. These are untreated rats. Let's say that a researcher injects one of the rats with the growth hormone that he developed and weighs it when it reaches maturity. So in infancy, you snatch out one of the rats, you stick a needle in it, you let it grow up, and see did the growth hormone actually cause it to grow heavier than its peers. If you were to look at the distribution of rats once more, the representative individuals have a z-score near zero. Remember, the middle 70% fall between negative 1 and positive 1 standard deviations, or z, I should say z-scores. So a z-score of negative 1 and a z-score of positive 1 bound the middle 70% of the population. A z-score of negative 2 and a z-score of positive 2 bound the middle 95% of the distribution. So representative individuals are close to the mean. Extreme individuals are far, are far away from the, uh, from the mean. But in a normal population of untreated rats who didn't get a growth hormone, you are going to find that every once in a while you've just got a thin little rat down here who joined his little boy band and did his little thin things. And sometimes you're going to find a really beefy rat up here who just was born to be a fatty because he just had fat genes, okay? You're going to find that even without a growth hormone, sometimes you find a rat in the upper ends of the distribution. But most of the rats that haven't had a growth hormone are going to be somewhere near 400 grams. So let's imagine for a second that the rat we selected in infancy and it stuck with a needle and injected a growth hormone into ends up growing up and weighing 418 grams. Do you think the growth hormone worked? Probably not, because the rat is 
pretty close to 400. He's within this middle 70% of the distribution. You might ask the question instead, though, what if the rat weighed 450 grams? Do you think the growth hormone worked this time? Here you can see that the rat is two and a half standard deviations above the mean. He's way out in this tail. Now, remember, we can't prove the growth hormone worked. It seems unlikely that we would have just lucked into picking a baby rat destined to grow up fat. The one fatty rat with fat genes. But it's possible. It's probably more likely that the rat, uh, sorry, that the rat we gave growth hormone to actually grew fat because of the growth hormone. Because it's not likely that we just picked the, the, the fat rat at random and injected that one with the growth hormone. But it's still possible. In the normal distribution, sometimes, every now and then, you have fat rats, just by chance. So, uh, remember, once more, only 95% of the population falls between positive and negative two standard deviations. Another 5% naturally end up in either the low or the upper tails. So this rat could have been one of the few that would have ended up in the tails even without the growth hormone. But let's imagine instead we injected 10 rats and they were all in the tail of the distribution. They were all hovering around 450 grams. Would that make you more or less confident in the growth hormone's effectiveness? Why? It should make you much more confident because the likelihood of, ch uh, of picking 10 rats at random and having them all just by chance have fat genes, that's pretty unlikely. More likely is an explanation that you picked 10 ordinary rats with ordinary genes and you injected in them a growth hormone that actually caused them to get fatter. So the more likely explanation is that the growth hormone worked. Before we end, I'd just like to work, I'd like you to work through this practice example. You develop a new exercise regimen that only requires three minutes of activity. But the three minutes are very strenuous, and people have to do it five times, spaced out throughout the day. You want to see if this new regimen helps women lose more weight than a typical exercise regimen. You know that when women start exercising, they lose an average of 5.1 pounds in the first month, with a standard deviation of 1.3. Sketch the distribution of how much weight females typically lose through exercise. Next. Transform the entire distribution into z-scores and sketch that new distribution. What would its mean and standard deviation be? Finally, to test your new regimen, you ask your roommate to try your exercise program for a month. And at the end of the month, she lost 7 pounds. Did your program help her lose a lot more weight than people typically lose, just based on any ordinary exercise regimen? To answer this question, you should compute a z-score for how much weight she lost and then plot it on the z-score distribution that you drew up above for part two. Please pause your video and work through this example and then go ahead and proceed and I'll show you the, the answers. Here you can see the original distribution has a mean of 5.1 pounds with a standard deviation of 1.3. When you transform it for part uh, for part three into z-score units, you can see that the mean ends up being zero and the standard deviation ends up being one. And if you compute this person's original score of seven pounds lost into a z-score, you'll see that seven minus the mean divided by the standard deviation equals 1.46. And if you plot that in this distribution, you'll see that that lands somewhere around here. That is higher than the mean but it's only about in the top 90% or so of scores. And so we can't say that this, uh, just based on this one person taking the uh, new exercise program, we can't say that she lost a whole lot more than other people. It seems like she might have lost somewhat more than other people, but she still falls within the ordinary 95% of the distribution. 
If this person had lost so much that she fell way out here in the tail of the distribution, then you might begin to wonder if that exercise regimen had worked uh, really well. But so far, it seems like she lost an ordinary amount.